Okay, so as you will have heard everybody, this session is being recorded. So just to note that by participating, you kind of consent to it being recorded, uh, but we will turn off the recording before the Q&A session later on. So I would love to welcome you all to this session of the London Spinoza Circle. My name's Steph Marston, and I'm really delighted to be chairing this workshop. Uh, this workshop for Claire Carlyle's wonderful new book, Spinoza's Religion. So most of you will know Claire, I expect. She is the professor of, a professor of philosophy, the professor of philosophy at King's College London. And in the last three years, she's published three books of which this is the latest. So she's been a very busy woman. Um, so we have four great speakers today for the workshop. So first of all, Claire will introduce us to her book and to its themes to, to set up the session for further discussion. And then we will have some reflections on, chairs, on Claire's book from our panel. Um, first of all, from Marie Wood, who is doing her PhD at the University of Aberdeen and who's currently visiting Birkbeck here in London. Uh, then from Alex Douglas of St Andrews University, who was one of the um, instigators of the Spinoza Circle, I do believe. And finally, um, Susan James, the Professor of Philosophy from Birkbeck College, whose work on Spinoza I'm sure that many, most of you will be familiar with. So that's all set up for a lovely session. After that, um, as I say, we'll turn off the recording and we will have a short break before the Q&A session. Um, but um, that's, that should make for an excellent couple of hours in which we will all be duly enlightened and also able to participate and engage with all the speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Claire. Oh, thank you, Steph. Thanks so much for chairing and um, thank you everyone um, for coming. But thanks particularly to Sue um, for really kindly suggesting that we have this workshop. Um, but more than that, I mean, it's, it's very nice to be doing this in the London Spinoza Circle because um, I've been working on this, this. I mean, this is my first book on Spinoza and I've been working on it for quite a few years and really during that time, the Spinoza Circle has been just an amazing community of scholars within which and, and with which to be thinking about Spinoza. And I've just learned so much um, from, this, from this group. Um, uh, so Sue and also, you know, Alex sort of were, were the people who started the circle. And I think I've been in it pretty much from the start as well. So um, the book is the book has really kind of grown, grown sort of in the, in the circle um, and really been enriched by it. Um, so thank you so much to, to everyone here who's been part of that for the last few years. Um, I'm just going to talk quite briefly about the book. Obviously I'm not assuming um, people here have read it um, and then we'll be hearing the responses. So Spinoza's Religion is a book about the ethics. Most books on Spinoza's religion have concentrated more on the theologico-political treaties. It explores the possibility of a religious re reading of the ethics while showing how Spinoza calls into question the very concept of religion that is familiar to us today. Although my book isn't primarily concerned with questions of historical influence, it does make a case for situating Spinoza in a broadly, and I would say very broadly, Christian tradition, while recognizing that Spinoza you know, was not himself a Christian. Um, and I'm trying to reconfigure his significance with respect to this tradition um, in particular. Spinoza's thought was formed by Christian as well as by Jewish sources. His friends and correspondents were Christians of various stripes. He engaged closely with the New Testament, and of course he responded to a culture dominated by Calvinist and Catholic churches, which constrained the philosophical innovations of contemporaries like Descartes and Leibniz. It's worth noting that 17th century European Christianity was a mixed 
eclectic tradition itself shaped by its encounters with Jewish and Islamic thought and with diverse philosophies, Platonic, Aristotelian, Stoic, and so on. Rather than plunge into this intellectual milieu to try to pass strands of influence on Spinoza, um, in the book I'm more interested in rethinking his reception within a European philosophical tradition that remained deeply, though increasingly critically, entwined with Christian thought for centuries. I do think that the interpretations of Spinoza as an atheist, a radical secularist, even a reductive naturalist, often take a simplistic view of the Christian tradition. Spinoza did indeed criticize some aspects of Christianity very sharply. And as I said, you know, he, he wasn't a Christian. Um, he was under some, uh, some pressure to convert to Christianity and he always refused to do so. He, he deliberately set himself outside the church just as he also set himself outside the, the university. You know, he turned down a professorship um, as well. But having said this, Spinoza did engage with some of the core philosophical questions that shape Christian theology, questions about the relationship between God and the world, between divine and human agency and divine and human freedom. And we can, of course, also um, think about those questions in, in different religious traditions, too. So um, Spinoza, I think, has some really interesting theological insights to offer um, you know, for, for, for various different religious traditions. So just let me um, briefly sketch some of the key ideas explored in the book. My first chapter is titled Philosophy and Devotion. And this considers how Spinoza gave his life, his time, his attention, his labor to his philosophical pursuits and above all to crafting the ethics, his, his masterpiece. Drawing on Etienne Souriau's analysis of the spiritual character of creative work, whether artistic or intellectual, and also Michel Foucault's analysis of the spiritual exercises that were integral to philosophy before it ceased to be a way of life. I reflect on the way Spinoza lived his philosophical vocation. My second chapter focuses on the literary form of the ethics, suggesting that it offers the attentive reader a spiritual practice. I discuss how the deductive geometric structure of the text generates repetitions in the act of reading it, making us circle back again and again to previous propositions. Through this repetition, certain elements of the text, um, propositions or demonstrations or scolia, um, certain elements of the text gain a great density. If the book were a cathedral, these elements would be its thickest weight-bearing columns. So I call these, these elements super propositions. Um, and um, I give a list of, of, of these, I think there's 20 or so of them um, at the end of the chapter. They constitute a kind of skeleton of the ethics or perhaps the text's vital organs. I also explain how Spinoza's structuring of the text fits with um, the account of human thinking and knowing that he presents in part two of the ethics where he talks about um, habituation and the way ideas are associated in the mind. So basically I'm arguing that the text is designed um, to reorder the reader's imagination in the image of reason. So those first two chapters set out my orientation and method in interpreting the ethics. Um, chapter three argues that being in God is Spinoza's grounding ontological principle anchored in E1 Proposition 15, the most significant super proposition of part one, whatever is, is in God, and nothing can be or be conceived without God. So my phrase being in God is hyphenated, taking inspiration from Heidegger's concept of being in the world. My emphasis on being in God calls into question claims, quite common claims that Spinoza was a pantheist, as well as claims that he was an atheist. Of course, we must recognize that Spinoza's God is neither personal nor anthropomorphic. His phrase, God or nature, is a crucial reminder of this. A central question for Spinozism then is the meaning of being in God. What does it mean to be in God? One consequence of E1 Proposition 15, which I explore in my book, is that our philosophical thinking about God is unfolding within God. <clears throat> 
And this makes God a very peculiar object of philosophical inquiry, quite different from anything else we might attend to and think about. Subsequent chapters show that being in God is not only an ontological principle and a uniquely challenging epistemological task, but also an ethical, existential, and I argue a religious task. But what does this mean, a religious task? My final chapter confronts very directly Spinoza's concept of religion as this is delineated in the ethics. Unlike our modern conception of religion, which emerged following the Protestant Reformation and crystallized during Spinoza's lifetime, Spinoza's religion is not a matter of believing in doctrines or belonging to a specific social group, but instead it is a virtue, the virtue of religio. Um, and Spinoza describes this as a way of desiring and acting that expresses our being in God. I emphasize the affective as well as the active um, and, and intellectual aspects of this Spinoza's religion, um, offering interpretations of the concepts that constitute the vision of blessedness outlined in part five of the ethics, the intellectual love of God, the affect of acquiescentia, and the eternity of the human mind. So that I'm going to leave it there. Um, but thank you so much to the respondents for, for reading the book and for taking the time to, to think about it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank you very much, Claire. And so in the, in the traditions of the best kind of philosophy, we now move on to our respondents, our commentators. So I'd like to invite Marie to, uh, to let us know her thoughts. Thank you, Marie. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you um, to Claire for this truly wonderful work and for sharing your insights with us. I honestly enjoyed reading this book and I'm sure that it will evoke many fruitful discussions. So let me start with my brief comment. In Spinoza's religion, Claire offers us a manual how to read and reread the ethics to become religious in a Spinoza's sense. Reading this book feels like a deep dive into a Spinozist embrace as the spiritual paths we follow through Claire's elucidation of the ethics foreshadow the blessedness we shall strive for and experience in practicing Spinoza's religion. Claire's book advances a reading and manner of dealing with the ethics that permits us to perceive and to understand Spinoza by way of the middle as Deleuze once instructed the Spinoza reader. Even though her view on Spinoza's imminence differs from Deleuze, Claire, in a sense, also demonstrates what it means to be in the middle of Spinoza, while she pursues the Spinoza's question of being in God. This is evident not least in the composition of her book and the course of the argumentation, <clears throat> which does not work through the parts of the ethics in a linear fashion, but rather strides through the cloisters of demonstrations, the world of definitions and axioms, and along the supporting pillars of superpropositions that shape the edifice we call ethics, and in which we encounter Spinoza's religion. Not only the geometrical, precise and strict architecture, but also the dynamism and continuous transformation of the ethics become clear through Claire's reading. Her book explicates aspects of Spinoza's life and work that place his ethics in a new light, just the way as a room appears differently to us when light breaks through its windows. Her book presents the ethics as aesthetics as well as the dynamic texts, as a masterpiece of theoretical systematicity, as well as a form of spiritual exercise. In this double movement, in and through the ethics, Claire's book shows how to live out our being in God and become religious through growth and virtue and self-understanding. Two entwined aspects are essential to this transformational journey, repetition and practice, or to be more precise, self-practice. Both are central to giving our devotion to our imminent task, that is to express our being in God by knowing it and desiring it. In a sense, becoming religious and this association is almost inevitable given Claire's referencing of Foucault is the true aesthetics of existence. And just as an artistic oeuvre, this transformational process of the desiring subject demands for devotion. To devote ourselves, Claire writes, means, quote, to give ourselves, our time, our attention, our resources to something freely as we recognize a deep, lasting value and importance that is non-negotiable, irreplaceable, perhaps even unconditional. 
Diversion when practiced with duration care is an effective investment that allows us to immerse ourselves into the depths of divine nature. This transformation connected to the process of becoming religious, Claire explains, is a matter of desire, and it is not least this effective dimension that signals the impossibility of becoming religious in isolation. As Claire demonstrates, Spinoza's religion is a form of collective practice that creates and strengthens the social bonds through which we understand the value of sharing and human togetherness. It is a worldly religion as it strives for an explicitly social goal anchored in coexistence and urges us to turn towards the world so we might find so we may find understanding, freedom, and rest in it. Spinoza is not a religion of a separate anthropomorphic God, but a religion of being and participating in divine nature and power. Another point Claire highlights in this context is the circumstance that the reader of the ethics is already accustomed with core elements of Spinoza's religion, not only in a theoretical, but also in a practical and dynamic regard. The reader, or we might say practitioner of the ethics, must revisit several super propositions, rerun argumentative steps and chains of ideas, and must truly immerse and devote herself to the ethics. Hence, our own reading experience should echo Claire's observation how spirituality and philosophy flow together in the ethics. This confluence of spirituality and philosophy that is so characteristic for the peculiarity of Spinoza's religion also presents a major challenge to pre-modern foundations and traditional theological convictions, as well as to cardinal features of modern philosophical thought. This contributes to the difficulty of finding an answer to the question Claire embarks on, that is whether Spinoza's quote, vision of human beings and their place in the cosmos was radically secular or radically religious. Simultaneously, Claire rightly points out that the opposition articulated in this question already lays bare in how far our contemporary perspective is shaped by a modern concept of religion. Claire proposes that Spinoza forges an quote, alternative modernity that preserved some of the profound insights of his ancient and medieval forebears by setting them on new philosophical foundations. Hence, instead of falling prey to contemplating on Spinoza's religion through modern lenses, Claire invites us to rethink religion as a concept with Spinoza. Now, concepts frame the way we relate, make sense, and act upon the world surrounding us. In most cases, concept is equivocal with idea and Spinoza's ethics, and in those two ideas that we build conceptions of reality. Spinoza's ideas and arguments in the ethics aim to guide the reader towards a true understanding of reality. As a concept, then, religion is a way to arrive there. However, concepts are neither neutral nor ahistorical, but part of traditions, discourses, and power constellations. Claire's book attests to this as she aims to open a conceptual space and to bring Spinoza into conversation with other thinkers from the same or different religious traditions. The exploration of Spinoza's philosophical milieu, for example, the public affairs, as well as private discussions he participated in, enables her on the one hand to give context to Spinoza's ideas, to reveal the influences and the intellectual roots of his work, on the other hand, situating Spinoza's persona and philosophy helps to explain the cloud of his arguments and reverberation of his ideas, not only during his lifetime, but throughout the history of philosophy. As Claire traces aspects of Spinoza's religion within the European philosophical tradition, including among others, Augustine Aquinas, Heidegger, Foucault and Derrida, her discussion performs a dual movement by disclosing affinities and differences and concomitantly marking the importance of religion in intellectual as well as socio-political life. Thereby, this book also engages with the genealogy of a concept which is itself a product of and means of exclusionary mechanisms and whose geopolitical context, especially in its modern configuration, expands far beyond the shores of Europe. This matters as it adds another dimension to the reflection upon the relation between Spinoza's concept of religion and modernity and the question in how far Spinoza's philosophy does not fall prey to the troubles of modern thought. It is true that, as concluded at the end of the book, Spinoza's philosophy offers resistance to a range of diseases of modernity, including nihilism, voluntarism, and above all, dualism. But asking about religion as a concept and alternative approaches, I figure, also involves interrogating the socio-political power relations connected to the concept at stake. And thus, how Spinoza's religion relates to the arguably greatest disease of Euro-modernity, that is the enduring coloniality of power. <laughs>
this is not meant as a critique because I understand that this is not the main question this book sets out to answer. Rather, I would like to, pra to praise Claire's work for providing an approach and reading of the ethics, which, in my view, invites us to further think about Spinoza's philosophy and its entanglements with modernity. By asking about religion as a concept and question, Claire's book indeed opens a conceptual space for Spinoza's scholarship to engage with strands of critical theory that are deeply and inseparably entwined with modernity and its aftermath namely decolonial theory, critical race, and critical religion studies. One aspect of the invaluably important work done in these fields that I figure should also matter for future discussions in the conceptual space surrounding Spinoza's religion is the intimate relation of religion, race, and coloniality. As several scholars have compellingly demonstrated, the political theological conflicts regarding true religion of the 17th century, which as we know shaped Spinoza's philosophical journey, are not only inherently connected to the disputes of the 16th century, but also to the 15th century inquisition and conquest of the Americas. Thus, it has been argued that religion, starting in the beginning of the 16th century, was constructed and politicized to classify people and determine the politics of what it meant to be human. Arguably, these practices over religious differentiations, conflicts for power and claims of a true religion laid foundation for racial categories and colonial imaginaries. That the connection between the concept of religion, European colonialism, coloniality of power has often been concealed can, among other things, be explained by the dominant intellectual narratives of epistemic shifts surrounding modernity and enlightenment. The timeline underlying the epistemic shift, which allegedly marks the end of Europe's dark age and beginning of the European journey towards enlightenment and emancipation, not only rests upon the highly problematic secularization thesis, which enforces the separation between early modern religious Europe and modern secular enlightened Europe. Importantly, this narrative also flouts that the arguably darkest chapter of European history had approximately, and in terms of its duration, we might adjust, begun a century ago. This is why Sylvia Winter, different to, for example, Foucault, locates the, locates the epistemic shift to modern thought, not between the 16th and 17th century, but about 100 years earlier, when, as an effect of the Iberian colonial ventures and excessive movements, people across continents were brought into a single field of power. For Winter, it is 1492, a year which, in a sense, also heavily impacted Spinoza's life, that marks a new worldview. Sadly, even though this world we reflected our quote, actually already existing interrelationality and form of connectivity, it also grounded the coloniality of power. According to Winter, the only possible ethical commemoration of 1492 is to affirm the existing interrelationality and to cherish the opportunity of forming relations with another. The ethical task is, in other words, to redefine and embrace being human as a praxis based on our shared humanity. If we follow Winter's analysis, it might be in this sense that Spinoza is a radical modern thinker who understood the relationality of being and immanence of power and who can offer an ethical and spiritual orientation in an interrelated and connected world. There's one facet of Winter's ineffable complex reflections and understandings of religion that seems especially noteworthy in connection to Spinoza's religion. Winter understands religion as a form, a form of community formation and the modality by which humans realize their condition as human beings. Religion and being human emerge with another as religion is a form of bonding and narrating these bonds. For Winter, humans essentially are homo narrants, as it is through stories that they make sense of nature, of the nature of the cosmos and subsequently what it means to be human in the world. Adding a Spinoza's twist to winter, our ethical task then, could be described as finding narratives that center around a concept of religion that cherishes human togetherness and differences, and that promotes relations characterized by loving kindness instead of domination and exploitation. In my reading, Spinoza's religion, as portrayed in Claire's book, presents an alternative to what winter calls the sanctioning system of gods and the single god. The content of Spinoza's religion, as Claire emphasizes, are not confessions of faith or superstitious beliefs. It is not a church or a sect that aims to define the form we relate to God, ourselves, and others based on doctrines. 
Rather, the content understood as our devotional practices, our desires and actions follows the form of our ontological existence, that is our being in God, and finds an ethical orientation within it. As Claire beautifully writes, for Spinoza, religion is, quote, a matter of honor, justice, loving kindness, and holiness of life, which can be common to all. In this regard, I agree that Spinoza can be part of an alternative modernity, if we want to stick with this notion, and that the ethics can serve as a starting point for an alternative conception of religion, which we will hopefully further and collectively work on in the conceptual space Claire's book opens. For these dialogues and works, on alternative conceptions and better forms of socio-political coexistence and interactions, here I exceed Franz Fanon, Josias Tembo, the imperative must be to co-center voices and experiences of the subjects in the margins and form alliances that help us to overcome the tilts of modernity. As Claire emphasizes, when we follow Spinoza's religion, we consciously acknowledge our being in God and thus being with others, which is more than the affirmation of an ontological principle. It involves taking a stance towards the world and relating to our surrounding in an ethical way. This is expressed in the devotion we practice in Spinoza's religion, which can be seen as repeating expressions of affirmation or giving consent, namely consent not to be a single being. This echoes Edouard Lisson and Fred Moden, whose works I figure could also contribute to the conceptual space Claire's book provides. As we consent not to be a single being, we devote ourselves to something of a non-negotiable and deep lasting value that moves us while we can rest together. The ethical task of being in God is to act guided by the insight that true blessedness and freedom are opposed to fear, domination and oppression, but can be found through cherishing our connection with love and kindness and collective practice. Becoming religious in a Spinoza sense, we won't join a faith community, but we will become aware of the community of which we are part of as expressions of divine nature and power. Instead of construing artificial differences, we shall see what we have in common, as well as what makes the other unique and rejoice in our connection to them. Not discovering and practicing this form of community consent is tragic. But at times tragic action, that is the uncovering of what had gone unnoticed in Glissant's words, seems to be necessary to notice that the threat to our community sense, that our community sense is a threat. This threat, as Glissant notes, will not be discovered until the moment in which the community feels that the chain of affiliation has been broken. And for those who have not felt yet what has been broken, Spinoza's religion might evoke this feeling and yet the insight that not only we are part of one divine nature, but also that nature does not create nations, races, or mutually exclusive faith communities. Reading, feeling, and practicing the ethics might lead the way to stop performing the modern tragedy. It is also in this sense that Spinoza's religion can offer a remedy not only for the challenges of modernity, but maybe also for its greatest disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie, for that, for that really illuminating contribution. Um, we, I, I will ask Claire to respond to speakers at the end of the, of the workshop session. Um, so now we'll move on and I'd like to ask Alex to, to give his thoughts on Claire's book. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, and thank you again to um, everybody involved in putting this together. Um, and all of you for being here, and especially again to Claire for for writing this book. Um, I'm glad this isn't an author meets critics. It wasn't billed as an author meets critics event because I don't really have any uh, criticisms. I I think this is um, a really important book, which addresses something that was overlooked for a long time, at least in the English language scholarship, which is you Spinoza's know, relationship with Christian thought. Um, and Claire's given some reasons to, to take that relationship seriously. Um, I mean, broadly, as she said, Christian thought. Um, I am, um, you know, I mean, con considering, for example, just, just to say one thing, um, every time Spinoza talks about Jesus in the theological political treatise, he calls him Christus, you know, the, the Christ, the anointed one. He never uses Jesu. So the idea that this is not, uh, you know, an important um, tradition to him is, I think, uh, 
not worth considering and Claire has given the, uh, the attention to that connection that it deserves. I am, um, I mean, I won't give criticisms. I'll do something that is arguably even more annoying, which is um, connect my own ideas to those in, in Claire's book. But I, you know, I think that I'm, so I, I'm writing a book about beatitude in Spinoza, in Spinoza's notion of beatitude. So there are very profound connections between what Claire has been working on um, and what I'm thinking about. So I thought I would just focus on that for today. Um, you know, Marie has given this very nice piece of contextualization. So we're moving from the bird's eye view to a kind of worm's eye view now. Although so, some, of, some of what um, you were saying at the end, Marie, I think connects very interestingly to, to something I want to talk about as well. Um, so I'm interested in something that Claire was writing about even before this book, which is the, this idea of um, aqueous gentia in se ipso that Spinoza talks about. Um, so this is a, a term which is difficult to translate and Claire's book has a lot of interesting things to say about the history of it and the various attempts at translation. I have settled on calling it self-acquiescence, which is pretty direct. Um, I can you know, discuss reasons for doing that. But for now, I don't think they're worth thinking about. It's just that's what I'm going to say for, for the rest of this presentation. So this idea of self-acquiescence, Spinoza says at various points that this is the highest thing we can hope for, the highest good that we can hope to achieve. Now, the first interesting thing about that is Spinoza also says at other places, and within the same text, within the ethics itself, that the knowledge, the love of God is the highest thing we can hope for. So already there's something interesting happening there. Um, Claire mentions a, a figure named um, Pierre Poiret, who was um, a kind of mystic, a disciple, if you like, of uh, Antoinette Bourignon. And Pierre Poiret thinks that Spinoza's emphasis on self-acquiescence is uh, a manifestation of the sin of pride, basically. Poirot says, you know, our, our focus should always be on God. Our ultimate end should be not acquiescing in ourself, but acquiescing in God, in effect. And um, so I looked at Poirot only because of the prompt from Claire. Um, he says that, you know, this, the person who pursues this goal of self-acquiescence removes and denies God. His own aim, scopum is a term there, an archetype, principle and end, alpha and omega from whom, by whom, and to whom all things are. So Poirot thinks that acquiescing in yourself is uh, unworthy a goal and that, you know, we should remain focused on God as our ultimate end. So... Um, Claire has an interesting discussion of this on page 94 of her book. She points out that, um, of course, these things that Poirier wants to oppose are not uh, at all inconsistent in Spinoza. She writes, um, it is God's nature as substance to be in, say, to be in himself. So the more we are in ourselves, the more we share in God's nature. Um, so Spinoza, the reason I think he can have these two things as both the highest good, knowledge, understanding of God, and he also calls this love of God, and acquiescence in ourselves, um, and not be vulnerable to Poirot's complaint, is that for Spinoza, acquiescing in yourself is somehow a, a type of knowledge of God. And, and the explanation of this rests on this idea that um, Claire focuses on throughout the book, and it's kind of the centerpiece of the book, this idea of being in God, this relation um, that we have of being in God. Um, so that's the first thing that I thought I would mention. It's something I think very important that comes out of this. There's a bit of a mystery in Spinoza that's, um, that's resolved by this notion. Um, Another thing that uh, Claire points out is that Spinoza has this idea of, of self-acquiescence. Um, 
by the way, I think I, you know, I haven't said much about what this means, but you know, it could mean self-acceptance. Some people translate it as self-esteem. Um, Claire points out importantly that it contains quiesce, the word for rest, stillness. So it's it's a kind of uh, you know achievement of some sort of peace with yourself. I think that much is clear enough. And and Claire points out that Spinoza has these three types of cognition, which some of you will know about, others might not. The first covers roughly the imagination and the senses. He calls that the first kind of cognition. The second is reasoning. And the third is a big mystery, it has a kind of mystical air to it, um, intellectual knowledge, which Spinoza you know, describes as knowledge of things under the species of eternity. He also calls it the intellectual love of God. So, you know, that's the uh, that's the highest kind, and of course, there's huge debate over what it is. But Claire points out that Spinoza seems to have three types of self-acquiescence matching these three types of cognition. And that's an interesting point. And so um, what Pierre Poiret misses is he stays at this first level of knowledge of imagination the senses. He thinks of self-acquiescence as acquiescing in yourself merely as you you understand it through your imagination and your senses, that leaves out this very important feature of being in God. And so that's why he thinks there's a tension between setting self-acquiescence as your ultimate end and understanding that God is your true end. So that's one mystery solved, but I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot more going on here. Um, for one thing, Spinoza defines self-acquiescence as joy accompanied by an idea of yourself. So you're taking a kind of joy in yourself. But joy, Spinoza defines in turn as the mind's or the, the, the person's passage from a lesser to a greater perfection. But passage implies change, movement, transition. Acquiescence implies rest, stillness, achievement. So um, Yitzhak Melamed uh, and, and Claire both explain this as in terms of a, a, a new notion of joy, that when Spinoza talks about the highest type of self-acquiescence, joy accompanied by an idea of yourself, the joy here becomes what Spinoza calls beatitude. So whereas joy is a transition to a higher type of perfection, beatitude is the state of having achieved the highest perfection in yourself. So... But then we have the problem that Spinoza also says that beatitude is the same thing as the intellectual love of God. So beatitude, I'm saying, is, is uh, on Claire's reading, a type of self-acquiescence and also a type of love. Now what's strange is that self-acquiescence is defined as joy accompanied by an idea of yourself, or as Spinoza says, a, a, an internal cause at one point. Um, so joy accompanied by... Uh, an internal cause of the joy, which is you. And love is joy accompanied by the idea of an external cause, the, the object of your love. And so it seems weird for one in the same state to be joy accompanied by an idea of both an internal and an external cause. What's going on there? Well, here again, Claire, I think very nicely, um, elegantly explains this in terms of this relation of being in God. Something about our relation to God means that it's no longer appropriate really to talk about God as an internal or an external God, or uh, cause, sorry. Um, you know, our relationship to God is, is so intimate, so metaphysically intimate that one and the same state can be, as Claire puts it, the, the point at which the affects of self-acquiescence or acquiescentia and love converge. They converge to a single point. You have joy accompanied by this cause, which is both God and yourself somehow, both internal and external. Um, right, so that much I think is, is just um, exposition of uh, what Claire has to say, addressed to a problem that uh, I'm particularly concerned about. Now, there are a few problems that come up with this, I think, in my mind. So, so one issue is um, the idea that 
when you have this kind of knowledge, this kind of understanding of yourself, what you really have is self-acquiescence is, I think, difficult to understand because there's a, a paper by um, uh, Lily Allenen, uh, may she rest in peace, who, um, you know, she gives reasons to think that when you have this highest kind of knowledge, this understanding of yourself as being in God, you don't really have a notion of yourself at all. It's hard to see what the self is because you have this knowledge which is of things under a species of eternity. There's no longer any, you don't have things like joy in the old sense because you don't have transitions between things. Um, you don't have the sort of various passions which are associated with a temporal finite perspective. And so it's, it's difficult to see how this can be a notion of self at all. And just on this point, I think I would, um, I would also note that, um, what was I gonna say there? I, I would note that the in say that comes after aqueous kentia disappears in the fifth part of the ethics when Spinoza talks about this highest form of aqueous kentia. All of a sudden he, he drops that and he starts only using the term aqueous kentia animi. I double checked this and in, in the fifth part of the ethics you only have aqueous kentia animi of, of the soul but the insay goes away. So I think there's a reason the insay goes away which is that the idea of the self becomes very problematic when you move to this highest type of knowledge. Um, okay, so the connection with something that I've thought about, what I have been working on for a while is how we form ideas of ourselves, according to Spinoza. So Spinoza says that self-acquiescence is joy accompanied by an idea of yourself, but where do we get the idea of ourselves? I think that we get it for Spinoza from exemplars. We can't get it by introspecting. I think Spinoza is fairly clear on, on that. The mind can't know itself directly. So we form ideas of, of exemplars which model to ourselves, you know, what our, our true self is. Now, under the first kind of knowledge, imagination and experience, we might just look to examples around us, concrete, you know, uh, individuals who look worthy of emulation to us, figures of emulation. Um, in the second kind of knowledge, we might construct a rational exemplar for ourselves. This is uh, what Spinoza discusses in the, the preface to the fourth part of the ethics, the idea that we can, can create an exemplar, you know, a model of human nature for ourselves as our, our self-conception. And under the third kind of cognition, what we know fundamentally is God. We have this intellectual knowledge of God. So then I think God becomes our exemplar. Um, and so this is this I think is very consistent with with what Claire says because you know she says that there are three types of self acquiescence matching the three types of cognition, and I think that's right. And I think the reason for that is that the three types of acquiescence correspond to three types of ideas of ourselves, which we form under these different um, types of cognition. But that makes the third one very weird, right? Because under the third kind of cognition, that the object of our knowledge is God. Um, it's God. And yet it's also ourself. And so that's why this relation of, of being in God is so important. Just to strengthen that a bit, another thing that, that Claire talks about, which I found very interesting, is Spinoza says that when you have a proper understanding of God, you participate in God's nature. And Claire has pointed out that this notion of participation corresponds, you know, looking through sources like Aquinas, corresponds to this this Greek idea of mythexis, which is also somehow bound up with the idea of mimesis, imitation. Aristotle criticizes Plato for not distinguishing these two. And so it seems that when you have the third kind of cognition, when you have self-acquiescence based on this sort of cognition, you have an idea of yourself which is, is set by the model of God. And so you're imitating God. Um, so, so you acquiesce in yourself as uh, conforming to the exemplar of, of God. Now, just very quickly, I'll say a couple of things that are, are striking and, and potentially problematic about this, or this is a problem I'd like to work on. Um, and I have ideas about it. I'm not sure I'll have time to, to talk about those, but that's probably for the best because it's supposed to be about Claire's book. Um, but one is that 
In the Tractatus Theologian Politicus, Spinoza says very explicitly that the intellectual knowledge of God, which contemplates his nature as it really is in itself, is a nature which humans cannot imitate by a set rule of conduct, nor take as their example. But I think what's important here is that Spinoza is saying the idea of God doesn't provide an exemplar that we can emulate by a set rule of conduct or take as a determinate example. So I think what Spinoza, you know, in, in the highest kind of self-acquiescence and knowledge, when we do take God as an exemplar, we do it because we don't ascribe any determinate nature to God. When you understand God properly, I think what you understand is that God is what I call super determined. He doesn't have a limited determinate nature. His nature is expressed, and this is where it relates a bit to what Maria was talking about there. It's expressed through every individual thing, any and every individual thing. And so you're imitating a nature which is not limited to any determinate form. So you're, you're, imu you're imitating a nature which is in fact consistent with being anything at all. Um, so in identifying yourself with God, you're really identifying with each and every other thing um, around you as well. Um, so that's how I would cash out this fundamental notion of being in God that, um, you know, Claire, I think, really drives to the heart of and shows the importance of for understanding things like self-acquiescence in the, the highest form of cognition. Um, so, you know, th that in particular, I think, was, was probably the, the most exciting thing in a, in a book full of many exciting insights for me. So I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And thanks for that appreciation of Claire's thought and also insight into your own. Sorry, I really thought I'd unmuted myself. Anyway, I'll start again. Thank you, Alex, for, for that appreciation of Claire's thoughts and also the insight into your own. And I, I think it's definitely the first time I've ever heard anyone talk about beatitudo or acquiescentia in se ipso as a worm's eye view of Spinoza's thought. It's usually quite the reverse, I think. Um, but thank you very much for that. And now we will move on to hear from Sue. Thank you, Sue. Well, thank you all for uh, being here and um, Lauren for helping so much with the IT and Steph for chairing the session. Um, I should say that I've just learned a huge amount listening to the three of you and uh, coming last as I do, I'd quite like to start again and rewrite my comments, but here they are. So, Claire's new book brims with insight and passion, and I found it really, truly interesting to read. It's engaged, learned, and original. And if I had time, I'd like to talk about each of those qualities in more detail. But here, I'm going to concentrate on two aspects of Claire's overarching thesis, that the image of the good life defended in the ethics is a religious ideal. Spinoza's philosophy, she argues, is not just about learning to live together, but about learning to live in God. I'll first say something about Spinoza's conception of God, and I'll then comment on the process of cultivating what Claire calls being in God. The interconnected chapters that make up the book are, among other things, a personal engagement with Spinoza's conception of religion an existential exploration of the form of religious transformation that Claire finds in Spinoza and has also found helpful in her own life, she says. In the ethics, she argues, Spinoza takes us through a series of different ways of understanding our relationship with God, each more empowering than the last, and each with its own characteristic feelings or affects. When we imagine, the inadequacy of our distorted and sometimes superstitious ideas of our relationship to God is reflected in restless and unsatisfying affects. By contrast, reasoning gives us a fuller understanding of this relationship and brings with it a measure of stability and self-contentment, acquiescentia, 
that Alex has been talking about. Finally, though, intuitive knowledge, an immediate and utterly compelling sense of being in God is expressed in stillness and repose. In short, Spinoza tells a story of affective as much as cognitive transformation that culminates in a deep and tranquil love. This narrative, Claire argues, is significantly indebted to Christian theology, and I'm broadly in agreement with her. Moreover, as she explains, Spinoza's debt to Christianity is nowhere clearer than in part five of the ethics, where he spells out his conception of the intellectual love of God, itself a form of beatitude or salvation. The echoes of the New Testament that run through this section partly provide Spinoza with a means of communicating with his largely Christian readers. By couching his ideal of the good life in terms that would have been familiar to them, he draws them in. But the aspects of Christianity to which Spinoza appeals also play a more philosophical role. They give him a language for articulating his own ideas ideas that in some respects are of course dramatically at odds with Christian doctrine. Claire shows, I think, how productive it can be to read the ethics through this Christian lens. But her approach also raises a question. How far can Spinoza resort to the language of Christian theology without compromising his own vision? How far, for example, does his description of intuitive knowledge as a way of loving a God who loves himself rely on the anthropomorphism of Christian doctrine, which he himself rejects? Spinoza is sensitive to this line of questioning, of course. For example, as Claire points out, he hastens to acknowledge that what he is calling God's love differs radically from its human counterpart. But one might still wonder whether his argument gets free, not only from any metaphysical trace of anthropomorphism, but also from the affective aura that anthropomorphism lends to ideas of God. Claire addresses this question and I'll come back to her response. But first, perhaps a bit crudely, I'd like to pursue the question a little further. In definition eight of Ethics One, Spinoza defines eternity as existence itself, insofar as it's conceived to follow from the definition alone of the eternal thing. I want to take up this phrase, the eternal thing. The foremost eternal thing is surely God. So let's describe God in these terms and say that intuitive knowledge gives us an immediate and self-transforming understanding of being in the eternal thing. We rest in the eternal thing. We relate finite beings to the eternal thing. We love the eternal thing and so on. Now such a reductionist strategy may seem unbearably crude a deliberate exclusion of the rich connotations of Spinoza's notion of God and just the kind of thing Claire's trying to get away from. But setting those doubts aside for a minute, let's see if substituting the eternal thing for God can be a useful experiment. First, I want to suggest it offers a way to test the suspicion I just raised that Spinoza's argument relies on affects that are rooted in a more personal conception of God than his. For example, does his view that intuitive knowledge of being in God manifests itself in a feeling of peacefulness draw any of its persuasiveness from a lingering commitment to a God who cares for us in some quasi-human manner? Can we really make sense of the claim that intuitive knowledge of the eternal thing of existence or being itself brings tranquility and repose. I'm not going to try to answer that question here. I'm simply offering it as an illustration of the kind of philosophical help that the experiment might provide. At the same time, and perhaps more constructively, the experiment may, I think, help us to embrace the extent of Spinoza's philosophical ambition without slipping into inherited anthropomorphic prejudices. 
Spinoza asks us to understand God as the eternal thing. Can we, can we envisage such a transformation shorn of the props of personal religion? Can we flesh out the ideal he sketches purely on his own terms? Anticipating the issue I've just raised, Claire says in her afterword that Spinoza offers us the freedom to name this ontological ground as we wish, really, God or nature, Yahweh or substance. However, as she goes on to argue, choosing a name is not a matter of indifference, and Spinoza would surely have agreed. As he explains in the TTP, words acquire their evaluative connotations through use, and in many of its religious uses, the word God imports an aura of sacredness. In some ways, this is obviously an advantage, but perhaps it's also a problem. To return to the question I've been trying to articulate, how far does Spinoza's philosophy borrow this affective aura from Christianity rather than generating out of its own philosophical commitments? Before I leave this point, maybe I should add that I speak here as someone who in her own life finds no personal use for the name of God. Moving on now to my second point, another aspect of Claire's book that I found particularly thought provoking, which has already been mentioned, is her construal of reasoning as a kind of meditative or spiritual practice. Late on in the ethics, Spinoza recommends a form of self-discipline or training organized around what 17th century people described as maxims or commonplaces. Take some maxim like, it's better to return hate with love and internalize it by imagining what it would be like to return hate with love in various circumstances. Practice feeling what you would have to feel and doing what you would have to do to return hate with love until through repetition, the relevant affects and actions become second nature. As Claire illuminatingly shows, the ethics adopts an analogous approach. It keeps returning us to the central claims that she felicitously calls super propositions, approaching them from different directions and progressively familiarizing us with their antecedents and consequences. As with the enactment of maxims, stretches of reasoning become second nature, easy, comfortable passages of thought. Something comparable presumably applies to our intuitive knowledge of being in God. Presumably we cultivate this kind of understanding through repetitively structured practices that gradually familiarize us with the, co the cognitive and affective experiences it involves and give us confidence in our power to trust and use them. But I wonder how closely comparable Claire thinks these epistemic practices are to the ones we use to cultivate reason and imagination. To return to these, using maxims as Spinoza portrays it is a collective undertaking, organized around agreed precepts that reflect the political and social commitments of a community. To act on the maxim, return hate with love, for example, is to act in accordance with laws that outlaw vengefulness and to conform to social norms of civility and self-restraint. It's something we do together. So too with reasoning. Reasoning is a discipline that people learn and teach. It's exemplified by particular texts or institutions. It's policed by various authorities and it's used to assess po political as well as philosophical processes. Again, it's something we do together. In all his major works, Spinoza emphasizes the importance of using imagination and reason to increase our collective power, to create ways of life that are progressively more harmonious, rewarding and fulfilling. And in this respect, his philosophy is pervasively political. So what happens to politics when we come to intuitive knowledge? On the face of things, 
Spinoza seems to turn away from the social and political in order to explore our individual experience of being in God. It's the individual philosopher who, coming face to face with intuitive knowledge, sees and feels everything in a different way. It's the individual philosopher who experiences God in all his immediacy and simplicity and undergoes a transformation of the self. As Claire points out, Spinoza is anxious not to prescribe any particular means of bringing this change about. It can happen in lots of ways. And as Alex suggests, it seems to happen, be able to happen in kind of infinitely many ways. I'd like to take up that point. But just as Spinoza argues that different religious sects should develop their own imaginative practices to help them obey the divine law, so presumably he might allow that groups of philosophers should develop practices that build up their intuitive understanding. And perhaps this project also has a political aspect. Perhaps one of the aspirations of a political community should be to encourage and protect such practices, whatever they may be. At various points in her book, Claire affirms that cultivating being in God is a social undertaking. For Spinoza, she says, the highest good is explicitly social to arrive with other individuals, if possible, at the enjoyment of this goal. However, the collective aspect of this project, it seems to me, is not so much developed, the political aspect of this project. This is not in the least a complaint. The book is enormously rich, but it is perhaps one of the questions Claire bequeaths to the rest of us. Can we now, find shared interpretations of what she characterizes as Spinoza's religion, the intuitive knowledge of being in and loving God and learn to practice them together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sue, for that. And, um, and I'm sure that we've all been enriched by the, the various commentaries that we've heard this afternoon. Um, I'd like to hand over to Claire now to give any thoughts in response to those, to those commentaries in the workshop. Thank you, Claire. Well, thank, thank you, Steph, and thanks so much, um, Marie and Alex and Sue. It's just been such a delight <laughs> to hear you um, not just telling me that you enjoyed the book, but more importantly, sort of thinking with the book and, and sort of from the book, that's exactly um, what I hoped uh, would, 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 be ha would happen, um, you know, as I was writing the book, what I, would, what I most wished for was for the kinds of reflex reflections and conversations and just the way, um, I mean, as I said at the beginning, I think my, my book itself kind of grew out of so many conversations, <laughs> including with people here, um, and then for it to sort of continue to be in a, in a sense sort of yeah creating new conversations and be a kind of conversation partner for other people who are thinking through Spinoza that's just kind of amazing <laughs> so so thank you um I think I'll go in reverse order and start with um a few reflections on what Sue said and then Alex and then come back to Marie at the end um Sue thank you so much for those comments um I think it, so, so, you know, Sue introduced me to Spinoza when I was an undergraduate, like 25 years ago or something. So it's just, I just feel so honored and privileged that, you know, all these years later, she's, she's read my book on Spinoza and, and uh, has, has offered these reflections. So thank you so much, Sue. I'm, I'm so indebted to you um, for even understanding Spinoza well enough in the first place to kind of be motivated to, to keep going with him over all this time. Um, I, I like I like this suggestion that that um, for for Spinoza God is the eternal thing. Um, I, I I I think there's a real kind of ambivalence about this name of God. On the one hand, um, it has the advantage of kind of connecting Spinoza to these long and very rich traditions, 
not only of theological thinking, but of sort of practice and art and, you know, so, so much that I think Spinoza does have a contribution to make to those, those sort of rich and multiple theistic traditions. So on the one hand, um, I, I'm glad he used the word God because it does connect his philosophy to all this. But on the other hand, um, the name of God, you know, has, has so much kind of cultural baggage and can also be an obstacle. Um, so I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I, I, like, I like this phrase, God or nature. I think it gives us actually th sort of three different options, at least. We can say God, um, we can say nature, <laughs> we can say God or nature. Um, and those three, those three names sort of lead in, in, in different directions. Um, so um, I think it's just a really intriguing question as to whether Spinoza is, as, as, as you put it, Sue, borrowing the kind of effective aura from Christianity or whether his philosophy itself can sort of generate that. Um, I mean, I guess I do think that, that, that peace, which is, um, I think, perhaps the most fundamental, um, not exactly virtue, but the most fundamental good for Spinoza. I mean, it's in, it's in as Alex said, it's in this, this concept of acquiescentia, which Spinoza says is the highest thing we can hope for. Um, but peace is so, is so fundamental. Um, and I think that, you know, Spinoza, right, right in, the, in his earliest work, talked about the kind of restlessness um, and anxiety and, education, and, and agitation that comes from striving for things that, that are transient and, 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 and perhaps themselves inherently un unstable. Um, whereas something eternal is, is, is what can bring peace. So I think Spinoza himself, he, and, that, and that's even before he, he would sort of attach the name of God to it or situate that reflection in any particular cultural religious tradition. So I think for Spinoza, just um, sort of the, the quality of, of eternity um, and, uh, and, and of being, um, that itself, I think, does sort of generate um, this, this, this sort of affect. I mean, peace is not simply an affect, but it does, it is something I think that Spinoza thinks can be experienced and, that, and then, then it becomes a kind of effective quality. Um, but I also think that Spinoza's philosophy is open enough to allow people to kind of clothe that in more, in kind of thicker um, sort of perhaps, yeah, more kind of specific or determinate religious imagery. Um, I mean, interestingly, I, I, one of the, one of, you know, my last book was on Kierkegaard. So, so, um, and I've, I've basically been sort of working on Kierkegaard as I, as I was writing this book. And, and um, so they're really different thinkers, but occasionally there'll be something really, really kind of connecting between the two. And one actually is this idea of resting in God. Um, that for, um, you know, Kierkegaard, for all his emphasis on anxiety and unrest, um, he, his ideal of, of, of what faith would be, would be, would be resting in God. And for Kierkegaard, he kind of imagines that as a kind of um, resting in a kind of maternal embrace, you know, this idea of a child and its mother and the kind of rest um, that that kind of relationship brings. So that's a very, very human, you know, very sort of human shaped way of thinking about this quality of, of rest and peace. Um, and I think it's totally sort of legitimate on, on, on Spinoza's grounds to kind of, you know, Spinoza talks about the fact that, that religious, um, that religion has to be appropriated by individuals and by communities in the way that's going to make it most sort of livable for them. Um, and so that appropriation can, I think, go in all sorts of different directions. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily kind of unspinozist to clothe um, these these kinds of ideas in the in the aura of a of a Christian tradition or or in any other religious tradition. Um, and yet I don't I wouldn't say that his philosophy depends on on that clothing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess that that would be my my sort of provisional response. Um, does Spinoza is can, can it can this sort of intuitive knowledge of of being in God be collective? Um, I do think that that 
there's a kind of, I mean, I often think of Spinoza and his group, his sort of group of, of friends and, and you know, people that used to meet together and talk about philosophy as a kind of microcosm of the sort of collective um, gathering that, that could perhaps, um, you know, be, be a sort of Spinozist religion. Um, and I, I do imagine a, a kind of a kind of communion there, a, a, a sort of feel, a feeling of of togetherness in understanding. Um, and one of the things about intuitive knowledge is that it has this sort of feeling, immediate kind of feeling quality to it. Um, and I think that that sort of shared, whether it's shared intellectual practice or shared religious practice, can have that immediacy of feeling and and communion. And perhaps in a more sort of prosaic sense. Um, Spinozism, I think, at least um, removes some of the obstacles to um, collective um, understanding um, because of the way he um, because of the way he kind of unsettles um, religious sectarianism. Um, and obviously, you know, his 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 aim is is quite sort of universalist. Um, so even even yeah. So even if um, I'm not sure about some concrete proposals, um, but at least I think that in, in some quite concrete ways, he's removing some of the obstacles to, to collective um, forms of religious life in the highest sense. Um, and that perhaps takes me to Alex's um, comments quite nicely. Um, what what Alex what Alex reminded me of in my own book that I quite quite enjoyed thinking about again was this was this. Um, sort of profound non-dualism that I see as really, um, for me, one of the most attractive things about Spinozism, about Spinoza's philosophy. Um, so yeah, the, the, the ultimately, you know, acquiescing in yourself, because if, 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 if our being is always a being in God, then acquiescing in ourself is, is at the same time resting in God. And so ultimately that kind of dualism between self and other, um, between, um, as Alex put it, sort of in, in loving something internal and loving something external. That th those that kind of doesn't ultimately um, that dualism just sort of is, isn't isn't really something real. Um, and again, this really intriguing question: Well, what what is the self in Aquius Gentia in Se Ipso? Um, what is this self acceptance? Where's the self there? And again, ultimately, I think as Alex was suggesting, it, it kind of um, I don't know if it's fair, right to say it, it evaporates, but it, it becomes it becomes identical with um, not not self. Um, uh, what is what is what is other? Um, and yes, as, as you as you mentioned, Alex, it's interesting the shift from acquiescentia and so to acquiescentia animi. Um, and I'd like to think a bit more about that concept of of, of animi. You know the um, sometimes it's translated acquiescentia anime is translated as sort of peace of mind, but anime is 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 a concept that you know we often we might also translate it as soul and perhaps so it, I think it would be interesting to think more but a bit more about why Spinoza helps himself to that concept of an, an, um, the, the soul at that point in the ethics. Um, I mean, I guess I one of the things that I thought about quite a lot while I was writing the book was the, the limits of language and, and, and finding Spinoza kind of wrestling with not just the limits of, of, of language and not, not just the limits of words and their meaning, but grammar itself um, and the whole sort of grammatical structure of subject and object when, you know, God itself is, is, is neither a subject nor an object. And I think that's, this is really some, a place where we can learn a lot from, you know, a very, very rich and, and long theological tradition um, which has grappled with the, these questions and often gone in quite sort of apophatic or what's sometimes called some negative theological directions and really acknowledged um, that the, the limits of language. And it's something that I think about when, um, so I was having a, a sort of a, an exchange with um, Edwin Curley and Stephen Nadler recently about, um, about this sort of idea of, of, of being in God and um, they they sort of wanted to push me to say to, to, to kind of say well what kind of a model of, of a relationship is this is it like causal adherence you know is it like a substance and its properties or is it like something else and just sort of I think 
sort of to a theologian's ears, not that I'm a theologian, but I know I, I know enough theologians to sort of know what they would say to that, which is that this is a, you know, it, this is a relation that can't be articulated in terms of other kinds of relations that we might encounter in the world. Yeah, this is a, a unique relation. It's 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 sort of sui generis, and so it's we can't explain um, the relation between God and, and finite things in in, in the using the kinds of concepts and the kind of language that we'd use to describe the relations between finite things. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's something that um, I personally found really helpful. Um, my kind of acquaintance with, with, with theology, with Christian theology, I found that really helpful to sort of bring, bring to my reading of Spinoza. Um, yeah. And I also really like what you say, Alex, about the, um, the connection, I, I think it's really, I really like the way you think more about the connection between participate, the concept of participation, which Spinoza uses alongside the concept of expression, which has really been very much noted in Spinoza, but I'd want to place participation alongside expression as a really important sort of verb in, in, in Spinozism. But the relationship between that and imitation, because as you say, it's something that goes right back to um, the, the evolution of the concept of participation in, in Plato and Aristotle, um, and actually, as you say, that concept of imitation is also there in Spinoza. And I, I didn't really make that connection, but I think that's brilliant to, to kind of pursue that connection further and think about um, imitating God, imitating um, perhaps human exemplars who can kind of um, express um, this quality of being in God. You know, it's perhaps some people express it or manifest that more than other people and, the, and the, that they can become a kind of mediation between, um, you know, ourselves and then what might seem like quite an abstract um, notion of God um, that we have in Spinozism. So thank you so much um, for that. Um, and then finally, Marie, again, I am just really happy to, to sort of hear you, hear you sort of thinking with the book um, and taking some of some of the questions that I that I explore in the book into new directions. Um, I didn't know about is it Syl Sylvie Winter? That just, that's something I must read. It sounds really interesting. Uh, so thanks for for sort of switching me on to that. Um, yeah, as you say, these questions of, of power, um, political questions. Um, I do, I, I must confess, I do sort of shy away from, from, from um, those questions a bit in, in, um, in my work, not just on, on Spinoza, but otherwise. And it's not because I don't think they're important, because I just find them very intimidating and difficult to think about. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that, that, that you're kind of, I mean, you know, Sue, Sue's work also, um, you know, has, has, really really is thinking through these more political implications and political dimensions so i'm i'm grateful to, <laughs> to to you for sort of taking taking those insights in those directions um and you know i do i do think that spinoza i do kind of argue and i think this argument probably needs to be developed but in the book i do argue that you know spinoza offers us this kind of alternative um model of religious life um that really can kind of embrace religious diversity um, and, um, you know, and can kind of on the one hand, try to reach for um, what might be common to human beings, but also I think not just trying to dissolve those differences, but, but living with those differences and recognizing that there are different paths. Um, that even individuals within 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 any particular tradition are going to have different different paths. Some may be more imaginative and devotional. Some may be more intellectual. Um, some may be more kind of ethic, ethical, um, you know. But also that there are these different traditions. Um, and I I I do think it's a great strength and a great virtue of Spinozism that he he can be and he sort of has been translated into these different traditions. I mean, there are books on about Spinoza and, and sort of Buddhism or Spinoza and yoga. And, you know, I really, I really love, I love the fact that, that he is so kind of generative in, in, in that sense. And I think it's because he, um, it's kind of the, the, the payoff for his own refusal to um, conform and, and, and to kind of, yeah, kind of philosophize within a tradition. I mean, that, 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 creates some difficulties in some ways, but it's also, I think, 
now, you know, now for us in the 21st century, that's just a real kind of blessing that that um, that his his willingness to stand outside those traditions, I think, has really kind of paid off. Um, OK, I'll stop going on because um, I'm sure there are questions and comments that other people would want to make. Thank you, Claire. Shall we all thank Claire and all of our speakers today? I think the workshop part of this session has been absolutely wonderful, really fantastic, original thinking coming out there and lots of, I really like the fact that we are philosophizing in conversation here and, uh, and people are exchanging ideas and, and being stimulated by each other's ideas. So now we'll take um, a five minute break so that everyone can have a stretch and get up and move around and we don't just fossilize sitting here at our, at, at our computers. Um, and we'll return in, in a few minutes time, in five minutes time, just before half past four. Thank you very much, everybody.